Something is happening. Are you paying attention? So here we are in the 21st century, a global marketplace, an era where design impacts everything around us. And better yet, we're here to talk about dispensary design, as in cannabis dispensary design, pot shops, collectives. I don't know about you, but I sure as hell didn't see this all coming five years ago, 10 years ago, 30 years ago. This being legal cannabis. This being an open, public, professional dialogue about designing stores where people go to buy weed. This being a legitimate global industry born out of decades of lies about a plant, of propaganda about its effects, of stereotypes of its users, of underground societies, of black market systems, of a drug war that has failed so miserably to do anything that it set out to do. This is an opportunity to erase the human error of cannabis prohibition. A plant that was unjustly removed from the pharmacopoeia and its benefits nearly erased from the memory of society. A plant that throughout human history has been a healing medicine, a spiritual vehicle, even a sustainable building material. A plant that when used properly brings better health, a more conscious mindset, positive thinking, a deeper connection to the world around us. This is an opportunity to bring an ancient remedy back into our collective conscience, back into our bodies and minds. The same bodies and minds who are screaming at us, begging us to stop harming their chemistry with our pharmaceuticals and petrochemicals and overly processed and genetically modified foods. This is a paradigm shift, a fundamental change in thinking, and every single person who has risked freedom and acceptance and reputation and relationships Every single one of us who is playing a role in helping the cannabis plant and its users step out of the shadows of society and into a legitimate existence in our communities, in our store environments, and even on this stage today is a hero. A fucking hero. By being cannabis retailers, you are the threshold to true social change and enlightenment. You sell hope. You sell joy. You sell peace, purpose, identity. You give people community. You give people their health back, their quality of life back, their integrity back. You save lives. Cannabis isn't like other products, other medicines, other substances, other business models. And this is where we, as dispensary operators and designers, have a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to seize. This is the biggest thing happening in retail today. We must create a road to a deeper, more meaningful connection to cannabis. This is our opportunity to rewrite history. So pay attention, something is happening and we're just getting started. Great video and it really sort of just shows your universe. Uh, I wanna just start on a quote that you have in that video. Uh, this is the biggest thing happening in retail. Um, can you tell us why that is? Well, I think beyond what the video stated, um, it truly is. You know, we're not just here watching cannabis emerge from nearly a centuries-long prohibition in the U.S. Um, our neighbors to the north are a year ahead of us in this game. Um, we have countries in Uruguay, like Uruguay and, and other countries south of our border that have also embraced this, as well as the European Union. Um, and this is all about bringing something that we as humans through millennia used to use as a daily supplement almost, as a part of our pharmacopoeia, um, really back into society in a way that um, properly introduces it to the world. And this all relies on the retail space. Um, you know, this isn't about, you know, all of us learning how to grow pot in our backyards. Um, this is about creating a, an industry where you can um, access stuff that for many people is life-saving, um, if not just, you know, simply life-changing and uh, life-enhancing. Right, so look, I, I do want to take it back a bit, though, uh, because you first started your career in cannabis as a bud tender. Um, and certainly the designs that were showing up here, that, that Shops didn't look like that when you started. So can we just uh, bring up a few photos of examples of uh, the, the difference is quite stark. What was it like when you got into the industry? Well, 
<clears throat> my first venture into the industry was actually as a patient, as a, as a consumer. Um, and this was back in the early 2000s. I just moved to California from the Midwest and was aware that they had a medical program um, and went about getting my card so I didn't have to worry about being arrested or um, you know, wanted to use this properly. And so I, you know, even from the first experience of going to the doctor's office to get my card, it felt anything but legitimate. Um, and I, it certainly didn't feel like a place surrounded by peers or people that felt like me or thought like me. Um, it was very clandestine and very dirty and very scary. Um, but it was also pretty novel, um, you know, so you didn't really think much of it at the time. It was, you know, pretty much only existing on the West Coast and um, you know, in your early 20s, you're just excited that you can go into a store and choose, you know, the strain you want to buy. Um, and then the recession happened and I lost my job and I went back to design school and the dispensary I was going to at that time offered me that job. Um, and it was, you know, working in that store and, and talking to our customers and for the first time, um, you know, really seeing the, the segment of society that uses this product, you know, on a regular basis as part of a, of a health routine um, that changed my perspective of it. Um, and yet still, you know, in my opinion, it was the coolest thing you could ever walk into a store and buy, and yet it was the most um, off-putting experience. Um, you know, this was a, a product that was literally saving people's lives, and yet, you know, people had to go buy it in places that felt like it was a danger to their lives. And that just never made sense to me. Um, and it was while working in that dispensary um, that my owner obviously knew I was going through design school and offered me you know, the opportunity to kind of clean up the shop a little bit. Uh, and he ran a pretty professional business you know, anyways, you know, comparably speaking. And you know, with some simple you know, refreshing of paint and swapping out of floors um, to cheap wood look LVT and you know, buying some fresh display cases, you know, our patients started calling us the Tiffany's of dispensaries, which was such a stretch. But it was that impact on that customer experience, how just a little bit of attention to this retail space was having such an impact on these people's um, perception, um, their comfort level, um, you know, and, and from a business standpoint, you know, how much they spent time in our store, how much they bought, how much they trusted us, how loyal they were, what they were saying about us on our online reviews, um, how much they were referring people to us. Our, our business grew exponentially over the next two years. Um, and so it just became very obvious to me that this industry was really ripe for a reinvention, um, even though at the time, you know, this industry, we never saw it going as far and as fast as it's come. Yeah, well, I mean, your designs speak for themselves in terms of uh, evolving that and how far the space has come. Uh, but obviously, there's still a stigma attached to cannabis, and uh, you know, old yeah. designs are very much a part of that. How big is the challenge ahead then, and what are you focusing on to really shift the stigma? The challenge is really big um, because now you know it, it went from being kind of this um, counterculture, anti-establishment industry to very quickly being you know a product of capitalism. Um, you know, so, you know, kind of before we were able to really teach the industry, you know, how important design and presence is in this space, you know, now people are kind of jumping ahead to me, like, we have to build 20 of them at a time, or 300 of them at a time. Um, but, not, needless to say, um, you know, design is a, a really important thing, and, and it's that stigma that is, is so important, um, you know, to design's kind of end goal. The industry, you know, I like to, you know, kind of think that we wouldn't have progressed as far and as quickly if there wouldn't have been, you know, a new example of what this was. Um, you know, when I started High Road six years ago, uh, I did not start it because I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I really wanted to affect this area of the world. And when I went looking for uh, designers or architecture firms who were already focusing on this, um, you know, you didn't find anything like this. You know, dispensary design was not a Google search term back in 2013. Um, and what you did find were very similar to those kind of creepy photos that we showed a little bit ago. Um, and, and that wasn't gonna further this industry. This wasn't gonna further this, this uh, evolution. Um, you know, and it still to this day is a, is a hard thing. You know, Americans can wrap their minds around cannabis being safe for, you know, their mother who has cancer or, um, you know, their friend who has AIDS or, um, you know, themselves when they can't sleep. But, 
you know, allowing these businesses to exist on Main Street or in our communities is, is still a big leap for people to take, and it's, it's this stigma around it that we're still fighting. Um, you know, and, and even, you know, to attest to its, its difficult um, nature of overcoming, you know, I've, I've had a really good career in this industry. You know, my family and friends from the Midwest, where I'm from originally, have done nothing but support me, um, yet, you know, even people who have been able to be close to somebody who's been within the industry on a positive standpoint and you know, somebody who's really personally been very positively affected by cannabis, um, you know, still my closest relatives have a hard time accepting it for themselves. And so that's where I really see, even though it seems like we've come so far in such a short amount of time, um, there is still a big section of the world that still sees this as a, a criminal product, as something that is is dirty and is illicit and is dangerous. And um, that's just an education campaign that the industry has to do a better job at. It's extremely complex and it's, it is a fascinating world, and especially from that viewpoint. Uh, I, I do want to shift focus a bit though, because we, we're at retail, retail spaces and uh, I just want to widen it, I guess, for, the, for all of retail. What can uh, folks in this room here learn about what you do? Uh, get from what you do? <laughs> I've been thinking about this ever yeah. since you sent me the questions sure. last week um, because I really do hold the people in this room and in the retail and design industries in, in very high regard. Um, you know, it, it, we have so much to learn from retail and design in the cannabis space. Um, you know, if I had to really kind of flip it and, you know, kind of give the retail and design world something to look at cannabis to. You know, I think we do a really good job of making a lot out of nothing. Um, you know, these businesses are not often able to go in places where normal retail can exist. Um, they're kind of zoned into the not so friendly parts of town. Um, and yet they still tend to thrive, you know, and, and do very, very well. And so I think their ability to make the most of a situation is really positive. Um, but also, you know, cannabis right now is all about serving an a uneducated customer base or a, a miseducated customer base um, and serving a diverse customer base. Um, you know, a lot of people are very new to cannabis and, you know, need to spend a good 30 minutes to 60 minutes inside of the store the first few times they go, understanding that they're not walking in there to buy a joint. You know, now cannabis is, you know, 40 different strains of flour in a store, plus edibles, plus beverages, plus sublingual tablets. Um, you know, you can really customize your therapy in infinite ways and, and find a modality that works for any condition and, and any effect that you're going for. And that education process takes a lot of time, especially when somebody, you know, hasn't used cannabis since their college years or since the 60s, you know. Um, and, and kind of that re-education, that reintroduction process is huge. All at the same time that the core cannabis consumer is incredibly familiar with what they want and, and their their goal is to get in and out of these stores quickly. Um, you know, so you know, filtering people through a, a buy online pickup in store or some sort of an express order system, but still allowing them to have some sort of a, a sales process um, is, is kind of a tough thing. So I think cannabis does a really good job of overlaying a lot of regulatory and 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 um, programmatic burdens with just you know the end customer experience and figuring out a way to um, can you communicate this new experience to the customer. And I think that that's what cannabis retail really does well. Right, okay. And, and um, there is certainly elements when you look at your designs uh, that really make sense in terms of, uh, I guess, boutique retail, especially specialty retail. Uh, there's a lot of people in this room as well, uh, I guess, like AutoZone and Tractor Supply, as well as people with store footprints that stretch across, you know, outside of urban areas and into regional areas as well. So uh, do you have any sort of ideas about uh, you know, what they might be able to take away apart from the edu education piece? Yeah, you know, one of the biggest um, things that the cannabis industry has really strived to grow into the last couple years as we you know, want to become more of a regular part of society is attracting a new customer base. Um, and I think that that's you know, a common thread in some of these legacy retail segments. Um, you know, for instance, AutoZone or Tractor Supply. You know, probably very traditionally, um, you know, not a female forward 
market. I don't want to assume too much, but I'm you know probably safe in assuming. Um, and and the same thing with cannabis. You know, cannabis retailers and brands have really had to learn to um, not just focus on the the guaranteed customer that is going to walk through the door no matter what your dispensary looks like, and make sure that they're able to you know bring in women, seniors, um, you know, new customers into this and, and help them understand that this is a, a product and a space for them as well. And look, uh, stores being a physical, man physical manifestation of your brand, we talked a lot about uh, the uh, department store yesterday with Ron Johnson and uh, that idea of having your brand identity weaved into the space. With cannabis, there's no differentiation in products. I mean, there are heaps of products, but at the end of the day, they're all selling cannabis. So what do you do to sort of uh, create a unique uh, feel and really tell that brand story in the, uh, in the space? A lot of cannabis is certainly a commodity, but cannabis is also a connoisseur's product. Um, and so there is a quality differentiation. And, and you know, some of my favorite pro projects um, you know, were done for vertically integrated license holders, meaning that they were both the farm as well as the, the outlet store. Um, and getting to tell those unique stories, you know, whether it's a sustainable organic no-till cannabis farm in Oregon or it's a top-notch boutique grower in Arizona, you know, those points of differentiation are becoming more and more important in this industry as, you know, majority of the product becomes commoditized. You have to be able to communicate you know, you have to be able to put up your flag and, and, and attract your customer. And I think that that's really where, you know, the future of cannabis dispensaries is, is going to have some really fun things to play with. Um, you know, now that California is legal and we kind of have this incredible um, population to tap into, you know, I think the future of cannabis is going to hold a lot more specialty concept stores so that people can really tailor that brand message and that experience to a certain demographic of people that they want to serve. And now we have this breadth of products products where you could actually curate a product assortment to that as well, too. Excellent. And look, I just have one question, and I'm not sure if we'll have time for questions at the end, but uh, uh, the cannabis movement's happening at the same time, movements like Black Lives Matter, Me Too, and the climate change movement, that kind of thing. And uh, I think it's no coincidence that the customer is also rapidly evolving at the same time. Uh, and store closures are still happening. I think Lee mentioned yesterday 7,500 at this time this year, by this, for this year so far. Uh, what is it about, I, I guess, a large percentage of brands that aren't really understanding about the, the modern customer um, and, and what's happening at the moment? You, you, like you said in the video, something is happening. I think this era we're in where we have such infinite access to information um, and information that, you know, is also kind of fed to us through an algorithm of, you know, reinforcement of our own ideas is, is leading a lot of these big movements. Um, you know, in, in good ways and in bad, you know, the, the more you can dive deep into some of your own thoughts and beliefs, um, you know, the, the, the stronger, you know, opinions and, and um, efforts can sometimes become. And I think that that's, you know, one of the big forces behind cannabis. Um, you know, not only, you, do we know that it's it's medically important and, and it's a, a safe product? Um, you know, but now we also have access to through the Freedom of Information Act. You know, the history behind why cannabis even went illegal in the first place, and it's enraging. You know, it's one of these things that you know, growing up as a young adult, it, it's just another strike against all the all the systems and all the protections that you thought have been in place for you in the world. And and I think that that's a common thread in a lot of these kind of movements that have an element of outrage to them. Um, you know, people feel empowered and, and they want to change things um, because they see a, a different truth than what's been fed to them for a long time. And, and I think that that's a huge core of the cannabis industry um, and something that, you know, when, when you tap into this industry and, and you take on projects and you take on clients, I think it's very important to understand um, why this was illegal in the first place because it will really reshape your view of, of cannabis and its users.